Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Damon Noto. Our uh, final presenter this evening is um, a man, I think, who gets the credit for actually blowing the whistle on this together with David Kilgore, the re renowned international human rights lawyer, a recipient of the Order of Canada, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in combating forced organ harvesting in China, together with David mm -hmm. Kilgore, senior legal counsel for Amnesty International in Canada, author of Bloody Harvest, the Killing of, the co-author with David, of The Bloody Harvest, uh, the Killing of Fallen God for their Organs, and co-editor of State Organs, Transcendent Abuse. He's traveled around the world, he's made this a mission, over 40 countries to raise awareness and to uh, combat organ harvesting from Falun Gong practitioners in China. And he has received many prestigious awards for his work in law and human rights, but I know David well enough to tell you that he's not going to be satisfied until this situation is corrected. A great pleasure to welcome David Maynard. Thank you uh, very much for the introduction, um, and I, I will uh, try to be brief because we want to leave um, some time for questions. First of all, uh, I want to express my appreciation to Ethan Gutman and David Noto. I've been working on this issue now for over eight, eight years, and uh, when we started, David Kilburn and I were pretty much alone on, on the file, and, and it's a pleasure to have colleagues as informed and articulate uh, as Ethan and Damon are uh, jo joining uh, me in this work. I'm not going to talk about exactly the same thing you heard from Damon and Ethan about whether or not this abuse is happening. I I'm going to assume that you've been convinced by them, or at least you're troubled enough uh, that you want to do something about it. And I want to deal with the question about what can be done, uh, what can Canada do. First of all, I want to talk specifically about Ottawa uh, and, and what can be done here locally. And I want to draw your attention to Carleton University. Because there are eight Confucius Institutes in Canada, and Carleton uh, University has one of them. And uh, let me talk uh, about that by dealing with a particular individual in joke. In a case that I was involved in uh, as a lawyer, the case of Song Yu Zhao. She was an employee at the Confucius Institute at Master University and a Falun Gong practitioner. Confucius Institutes are uh, uh, funded and, and hired mm -hmm. by the government of China in China. Uh, when she was in China before joining the Institute, she had to sign a statement promising not to practice Falun Gong. She made a complaint against McMaster University to the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal. The complaint was settled and the terms of the settlement are confidential. McMaster University, after the complaint and after the settlement, announced that it decided to close its Confucius Institute uh, and gave it the notice of termination, and it did close. The handband hiring policy uh, for Confucius Institute excludes persons who practice Falun Gong. McMaster University determined that this policy violates its principles of equality. Now, after McMaster did that, the Canadian Association of University Teachers uh, in December uh, 2013 urged all Canadian universities and colleges to end ties with Confucius Institutes. In June of this year, the American Association of University Professors did the same thing, urging American universities to cease their involvement in the Confucius Institutes. The University of Chicago in September 2014 announced that it had suspended negotiations for a renewal of the agreement of, of their Confucius Institute. In this month, in October, Pennsylvania State University, uh, or Penn State, uh, said that it would not be continuing its agreement to host the Confucius Institute. Also this month, the Toronto District School Board Committee voted to terminate their Confucius Institute programs. So I would encourage those who are uh, present here tonight to help to wean uh, your local Carleton University off its Confucius Institute. Second thing uh, I, I would suggest is, is uh, a stronger development of professional ethics to deal with this issue. 
Now, I've dealt with the issue of professional ethics uh, in great detail over the years, and uh, as Rabbi Volk has said, I've been traveling a lot to talk about this issue. And uh, so I was in Italy, in, in Rome, in July this year, and I gave a talk to the, in, in the Italian parliament where I set out 35 different ethical principles that transplant profession could follow in order not to be complicit in transplant abuse in China. And all of the principles I set out there were drawn from existing professional standards. There are none of them I didn't, I didn't invent them on my own. They were drawn internationally from uh, uh, standards from the Transplantation Society, the Declaration of Istanbul on Organ Trafficking and Transplant Tourism, the World Health Organization, the World Medical Association. Nationally, these standards were drawn from principles in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Australia, Canada, and Malaysia. There is a policy statement of the Canadian Society of Transplantation and the Canadian Society of Nephrology on Organ Trafficking and Transplanterism, which is uh, from October 2010. And, and it's quite good on the, the kind of bundle of issues it, it addresses, patient-doctor interaction. And uh, of the 35 principles I set out, 14 were actually drawn from these Canadian standards. However, of course, 21 were not. And uh, all of the principles need to be uh, adopted, and, and the Canadian ones that have been articulated need to be implemented. Now, I, I mean, the principles are to a certain extent uh, obvious. Uh, for instance, don't, uh, if you're a doctor, don't uh, go abroad with, to China with a patient for transplantation. Don't refer a patient to China for transplantation. Don't refer a patient to a, a broker who's brokering transplants in China. Don't advertise any uh, transplant tourism into China, and so on. But uh, they're, they're all uh, uh, worthy principles. Uh, yet another area of policy has to do with anti-rejection uh, drug testing. Pharmaceutical companies should not be testing anti-rejection uh, drugs in China because uh, uh, of the sourcing uh, of the organs. That was an issue uh, with an Edmonton-based company, Isotechnica, which announced in 2012 that it intended to commence clinical trials in the end of August 2012 in China of the anti-rejection drug Voxlosporin under contract with the Chinese company. And the drug was to be used in kidney transplantation. Well, David and Kilgore and I, we wrote the government of Canada, the United States, and the European agencies that actually approve uh, drugs and asked them not to approve any drug that was uh, tested in this way. And we also, uh, also wrote us, Isotechnon and asked them to stop the plan for the test. And in fact, it's, uh, the test never happened. They, they didn't issue any statement to that effect, but the, the testing is public, so we could see it didn't happen. But we need a, a development within the drug uh, industry uh, about this. So uh, Pfizer has actually developed a very good policy, but there is no across, uh, uh, across the industry a uh, good policy. Now, that's a, a group of policies relating to profession. There's a second group of policies that are relating to Parliament. And I think Parliament could be doing a lot more than it has been doing uh, about uh, this issue of organ transplant abuse. Now, in terms of petitions, Parliament's been quite good. There have been, uh, according to my count, 25 different petitions from 19 different parliamentarians on the issue of killing of Falun for their organs. The first was presented as early as May 2006 by Paul Zappo, even before uh, David Kilber and I began our investigations, uh, after, shortly after Annie and Peter made their statements that this abuse was happening. Uh, the most recent uh, uh, petition that was presented, uh, was presented this month by Member of Parliament Joyce Smith. These petitions call on the Canadian government to help stop the atrocities by condemning the uh, government of China for uh, committing these crimes against humanity. They ask the government to urge, the Canadian government to urge the Chinese government and the persecution of Falun Gong practitioners and release all uh, Falun Gong practitioners in detention. They ask the government to take active measures to help stop the mass killing and organ harvesting of Falun Gong participants. They urge the government to discourage Canadians from traveling to China for organ transplants. So uh, the, present, the presenting of petitions has been done number. There have also been three different statements made by different members of the House of Commons uh, about the issue, uh, saying much the same as the petition. One by uh, Member of Parliament Wayne Marston in June 2007, uh, a second by Brent 
Ras Geber in May 2012, and a third by Jimmy Scrow in November 2012. There have also been three private members' bills presented to Parliament uh, on the issue. One was by Boris Rusnewski in February 2008, a second also by Boris Rusnewski in May 2009, and a third by Erwin Cutler in December 2013. These bills basically do two things. One is they uh, make the uh, offense of organ transplant abuse an extraterritorial offense, so that, I mean, obviously if you kill someone in Canada for their organs, you're going to be punished. But if you go abroad and you're complicit in the killing of someone abroad for the killing of the organs, and you come back to Canada, that's not a, a punishable crime in Canada. Uh, I mean, in, in theory, it, it might be a punishable crime in, in China, but uh, according to the criminal laws, but uh, nobody's being prosecuted in China for that. So uh, somebody who gets involved in, in, in organ transplant abuse outside of Canada and comes back to Canada, it, it, suffers no consequence, and the law needs to be changed so that uh, it's not just a territorial crime, it should be a, a, a global crime. A, uh, a, another thing that these bills do is they require compulsory reporting, so that uh, if, if somebody comes back from abroad and, and comes to a, a doctor or a hospital and needs anti-rejection drugs, and they've, they've, been, they've got the organ through organ transplant abuse abroad, and the, the doctor or the hospital has to report that to the authorities. The third thing that these uh, bills do is, is they ban entry into Canada of, uh, of foreigners who've been involved in organ transplant abuse. Uh, the, right now there is no, there, there are no immigration controls directed to that particular issue. There's no questions being asked. There is in the United States, but not in Canada, about participation in organ transplant abuse, and, and, and there should be. So, I mean, the, the private members' bills are good, but they, they need to be enacted. Yet another thing that the Parliament of Canada could do is enact a resolution, or at least somebody could propose a resolution. There's no resolution been enacted, and there's none that have been proposed. Now, resolutions are quite common in, in Taiwan. Uh, more than half the city and counties have enacted resolutions, um, starting from 2006. The United States Congress is actively considering a resolution that's gone through several steps. Uh, it was proposed in June 2013. The European Parliament um, enacted, uh, 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 passed a resolution